Good to have you this morning. Hey, I want to introduce somebody cool. It's great to meet new friends, and today I met a new one. Uh, this is Peter Lungu. Did I say it right? Good. I'm bad with names. That's pretty good, though. Uh, you all remember Dave and Tracy Murray. They're part of our church, and they moved. They went to uh, over to North Rise over in Zambia, and they're over there. And Peter is is from there. He's, he's here this weekend. Uh, he's going to be getting his Ph.D. Uh, at Grand Canyon. And what is that in? Uh, that's organizational leadership with emphasis in higher education. That's fantastic. It's going to be so good. And so, yeah, so I thought it was a good opportunity to be reminded that Dave and Tracy are over there. We said we'd be praying for them, and we have been, and we're excited about that. Tell us about the good things that are happening over at North Rise, happening in Zambia. What's going on over there? Well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you for sending Dave and Tracy Murray to Zambia. Uh, great people. We are serving with them together along the staff and students. Uh, serving a great God, uh, which is good. It's amazing that uh, we serve a God who cares. Uh, it's an opportunity, I think, for um, us in Zambia to save uh, Long, Dave, and Tracy. I think they've been great people to us, and uh, I report directly to Dave. Uh, he's my direct supervisor, great, great man, um, and uh, it's a pleasure. I think it's a, a good opportunity for me to learn from him. Yeah. Uh, for the many things that he, uh, he has gone through and the vast knowledge that he has and um, the, the, the doctorate that he actually got is the same doctorate that I'm doing. So I'm oh. following his footsteps. <laughs> Are you, does, he, does he let you have any of his notes or anything like that? Oh, yes. Does oh, he, yes. oh, very good. That's good. That's yes, good. actually, before I came for, for the residency, uh, we had to go through a lot of uh, notes uh, just for him to help me through and just... Um, uh, yeah, studying together, and uh, he's uh, he's a great guy. Yes, uh, good. I'm, I'm 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 blessed to work with him, and just for him to mentor me through the process of the PhD. We're big fans. We're big fans of Dave and Tracy. Well, you tell Dave and Tracy that we said hello uh, when you go back. How can we be praying for you uh, for the work that's happening over there? We, we're a church that prays. We want to be praying for you. How can we do that? Um, I think we need to pray for um, next year's impact. I'm sure uh, Kai and Adam have had an opportunity to come to Zambia to serve the, 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 the city of Ndola. So we have what we call Impact Ndola uh, 2023. So this is where we have uh, students, staff, and friends, and personally inviting all of you to come along. Uh, we serve students, we serve the community. So we've got different ministries, the Vocational Bible School. We've got Pastors Conference, Women's Conference. Uh, it's a one-week packed full of ministry and serving God, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the remotest part of the city where people have not had an opportunity to hear the good news of the Lord. So I think we need to pray for that. We yes. need to pray that uh, God provides a way and just for his word to get out there. Very, very good. So Peter's going to be with us all morning. He got here this morning, first thing. He helped us unload the trailer. I don't know if, if David told you had to. There's a lot of more work to do, so just hang on. Just kidding. No, no, it's good. Uh, Peter's going to be out in the lobby, on uh, the courtyard. He'd love to talk to you. Come over and talk to him. Uh, let me pray for Peter now, and then we're going to read, read uh, God's Word together. Uh, God, we thank you so much for Peter. Uh, we thank you for Dave and Tracy. We're thankful for this reminder of the work that's happening over there uh, in Zambia. Lord, we, we ask that you would make this church a good partner for that work that's going on over there. Lord, we ask that you would send people uh, from this church, from this body of believers over there uh, to be part of the things that are happening in Zambia and around the world uh, for, for our good and for your glory, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. You could stay standing for the reading of the scripture. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Good morning, church. This morning we'll be reading out of James 4, chapter 1, or sorry, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. If you don't have a Bible, ushers will be coming down the aisles now with those. You can go ahead and grab one um, and turn there. And if you have one of those Bibles, it'll be on page 1012. And if you don't own a Bible at home or in your household, go ahead and take that home with you. That's going to be our gift to you today. So again, James 4, 1 through 5. Follow along with me. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly, to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is not... It is to no purpose that the scripture says, 
He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for just allowing us to come together and gather in this place and dive into your word, Lord. Um, I pray that as we just hear from Mike, Lord, that you just allow him to speak to our hearts, that our hearts are open, and that you are present here in this place. We love you a lot. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, you can have a seat. Uh, It's so good to be with you all here this morning. Uh, If I've never met you before, my name is Mike Lee, and I get to be the pastor here at Mission Valley Church. Uh, if you're new, if you've come today as a guest of somebody, if you've come all the way uh, from across the, the world here, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, and if we've never met, I'd sure like to do that. And so there's a couple of ways that we can do that. Uh, I'm going to be out in the courtyard after service, love to shake hands, fist bump, whatever you're into out there. Uh, the Another way we could do that, you could just send me a text, 602-763-3331. People will ask me all the time, do you really mean to give out your number every week? Yes, I really mean to do that. Because if you need something during the week, if you need prayer, if you want to talk, I, I, I invite you to text me, any one of you, 602-763-3331. It's not hard to find me. Um, And then another way that you can do it is if you just fill out that connect card that McKenna talked about at the beginning, she'll talk about it again at the end. Just give us some basic information, your phone number, your email, and I will connect with you that way. So uh, we want to be a church where you can connect. So summer's coming. I don't know if you guys got the memo. Uh, We live here in Phoenix, but summer's coming. I don't know if you've felt it a little bit. I've noticed it. Summer's definitely coming. It's getting warmer. And with summer often means that people go on vacations. Uh, uh, do a lot of fun stuff. And so uh, my family is no different. We like to go on vacation. So here's a picture of my family uh, in Carlsbad. Uh, we're just chilling right there in Carlsbad, eating some ice cream, having a good time. Uh, I, Penny bought me that hat. I don't know why I wear that. But we like Carlsbad a lot. It's a, it's a nice little town. It's kind of a sleepy little town on the beach. Uh, the kids like to kind of go to the beach. They like to ride their skateboards. Uh, Penny likes to stroll through the town and, you know, buy stuff. And I like to eat at Vigalucci's. There's an Italian restaurant there, and I would just go all the way there. Somebody is shaking their head. Maybe you've been to Vigalucci's before. It's fantastic. So good. I would drive all the way there just to go to that. But at the end of the trip, every year when we get ready to come home, we think to ourselves, it was great to be here in Carlsbad, but I wouldn't want to live here in Carlsbad. It's not our home, right? A couple of months ago, we went on another vacation. Here's a picture of Penny and I in Seattle. This is like one of those like awkward like family slideshow things. Um, we're just going to show you all our vacation pictures. There's only three. It's not that weird. And it turns out we hate Seattle. If you like Seattle, I'm sorry for you. That's fine. That's your business. I don't like it. If one of the coolest things to do in your city is to stand in front of a gum wall, that's gross. Um, I, I find Seattle to be disgusting. I didn't love it there very much. Uh, there were some cool things to see, but in general, I found the city to be cold, wet, dirty, and it smelled much like pee. And so I didn't like it and it's not our home and we were happy to leave it. Yes. Uh, and then here's a picture of uh, my family in Disneyland. Uh, yes, I'm there with the, the, the blonde hair. Very nice. We love Disneyland. Uh, we love everything about Disneyland. We love all the rides, all the pretzels, all the fun, all the fireworks, all the dressing in Disney outfits. We love all the things about it. Um, but even Disneyland, as much as we love it, at the end of the trip, it's time to come home because it's not our home. And here's the thing that I want us to recognize and the thing that James wants these people that he's writing this letter to to recognize this this idea that he's that he's hammering at today in today's text is that this world will have some amazing things about it things that we love this world will have some beautiful places to visit beaches and mountains and it'll have beautiful people to be to 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 have in our lives to have great relationships with and at the same time this world will have things that we hate things like scorpions and 115 degree days and cancer and homelessness but no matter what for the christian this is not our home This is not our home. This is a place where we live. This is a place where we reside until Jesus comes to get us back. It is a place where we are living on mission, but this is not our home. As a matter of fact, this is our big idea today. Christian, recognize this world is where you live now. It is not your home. And James wants us to understand that, and he is writing this letter to these people that he cares about, these people who have become Christians to help them understand, hey, you are called to a different place now, and as you are walking around in this world, you will sometimes realize, this is not my home. And he wants them to understand that. As Christians who believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, people saved by the grace of God being transformed every day to be more like Jesus, this is not your home. This is just where you live right now. It is sort of like a temporary assignment, and there is a way to forget this. 
There's a way to forget this, to, to start thinking this is my place. There's a way to get caught up in thinking that this world and the things of it are ultimate and forget that God is ultimate. There is a way to worship the creation and not worship the creator. There is a way to think that all of the things of this world are permanent when the reality is that everything in this world is temporary. And so as we continue this series through the book of James called Not Like That, that's the idea James is running at today. Don't be thinking that this is it. Don't be thinking that this is all for you. And it's not surprising that James, the brother of Jesus, is drawing this distinction between the world and God because Jesus himself drew a similar distinction when he said, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Think about this. Jesus is literally saying you were in the world and then I came and chose you out of it. I came and saved you out of it. I came and pulled you out of it. And now you are no longer in it. You are set apart. You are something different. And other places in Scripture point to this same idea that there is a difference between the world and God. Paul writes to the Romans, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, it states it even more clearly, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so with this understanding that just like last week we said that there is worldly wisdom and there's godly wisdom, this week we're going to explore this text knowing that there are things of the world and things of God and they are not the same. They're not the same. This is different. The worldly ways, the worldly things are not godly things in godly ways. And so let's get into the text. And from it, we will pull five things that as Christians, we need to recognize as we walk around on our temporary home. I want us to recognize some things. James wants us to recognize some things. Like maybe we don't see that this is happening to us. And so he's asking us, hey, sort of stop what you're doing and recognize what's happening. And the first thing that he wants us to recognize is this. Christian, recognize you desire things that you should not have. Christian, recognize that you desire things that you should not have. Things that are not good for you. Things that are not profitable for you. Things that you just should not have. At least recognize it. Now you decide to do what you want with it. You have free will. But at least recognize that there are things in this world that you ought not have. James says this in 4.1, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Your actual passions, the things you desire, are at war within you. If this world is not your home, recognize that there are things in it that are just not for you. There are things and places and stuff in this very broken world that are not for you. They're not good for you. They're not meant for you. And they may very well be the very thing that you desire. Last week I talked about the heart and how the advice to listen to our heart is bad because our heart will often lead us astray. And I actually heard from some of you. People questioned me on that. And they said, hey, but I thought like, I thought that now that I'm a Christian, like I have a good heart. I thought now that I'm a Christian, like I desire better things. And I want to tell you this. Yes, I would remind you that, that we are people who are saved by grace, but we are being transformed daily. That the Bible says that Jesus has begun a good work in us and he will bring it to completion. But we are not complete yet. We are a work in progress. And so our hearts and our desires will often times still lead us astray church i want you to understand that your desires will sometimes lead you astray let me give a silly example for the last nine months i've been working really hard to get healthy and that has really come down to a couple of different things i'm trying to move my body and i'm trying to watch what i eat that's what i'm trying to do i'm trying to be intentional with it but here's what happened on friday when my alarm got off i didn't want to go for a walk i desired to stay in bed. 
I very much wanted to stay in bed. I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to do my work. I wanted to stay in bed. And then on Wednesday, I was at a meeting all day, and they had bagels out, lots of bagels, an entire tray of bagels. And I desired to eat them, all of them. I wanted every last bagel. I don't know how many I could have taken down, but I felt very strongly that I could have got after a lot of them. I wanted all of them. Now, don't at me and tell me it's okay to stay in bed or eat a bagel, because I know that it's okay. It's not my point. My point is that I've decided that I want to get healthy and part of getting healthy is going on these walks and not eating those bagels and yet my desire was still contrary to what I decided. I wanted those things and I want us to recognize that sometimes we will want things that we ought not have. We will want things that are not for us. James is saying that our desires will sometimes be at war within us. That we will desire something that is not of God so much that we actually feel at war in it. We feel uneasy about it. We feel not at peace with it. In other words, we will want things that we know we shouldn't have. You may want more money than you've earned. You may want more power than you need. You may want more stuff. You may want more security. And in a world this broken, you may want things that are not for you at all. As you're just walking around in this broken world, you should at least recognize that there is stuff in this world that's not for you. There are things in this world that are not for you. There are entire industries created in this world, in this very broken world, that were never intended for Christians to partake in. Let us at least recognize it. Let's at least have our eyes opened to it. There are things that are not for you. As people bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus, you can say to those desires, whatever they are, no thank you. As a person who is bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ with Holy Spirit power in you, you can say to those desires, no thank you, that is not for me, that is not what I want. I desire it, I recognize it, I want it, but I'm going to say no to that so that I can say yes to following Jesus because saying yes to following Jesus is sort of my best yes. I want us to at least recognize these desires. Church in Jesus, you can recognize and put down those desires. I have a dog. I have two dogs. I don't like either one of them, but I like one of them less than the other one. His name is George. He's really the worst dog in America, right? George is the worst dog in America. George is I don't know how to describe him. He just does whatever he wants. I look at George and I think that is what an unchecked desire looks like. Because if George sees food, he eats it. It doesn't matter to him that he's not supposed to have it. If he sees something that he wants, he goes after it. If the door's open, he knows he's not supposed to leave, but he'll run out. He is just a deplorable dog. He would be a horrible human being. He's like the worst kind of dog. But he's got these unchecked desires. If you drop food on the floor, George is getting it. He's getting after it. If he has to poop, he's just going to poop. He doesn't care where he's at. It could be your house, your room, the bathroom. He doesn't care. He is, he's a horrible dog. I hate him. So, I mean, I don't hate, I do. I don't, I don't like George. I, I, I I try, I mean, you guys, anybody wants him, they could have him. Courtney says no, but I don't like this dog. Anyways, but we're not like that. Like we want things that we know we shouldn't have and we are not some mindless dog like George. We can say, you know what, Jesus, I'm struggling with this. I really want this thing that's not for me. I'm going to ask you to help me with that desire. You see, in Jesus, we can recognize and put down those desires because if you don't put down those desires, I can assure you problems are coming. When we don't check those desires when we don't recognize those desires for things that we shouldn't have i can assure you that problems are coming christian recognize that unchecked desires give birth to sin church recognize that unchecked desires will give birth to sin this is what james says you desire and you do not have so you murder you covet and cannot obtain so you fight and quarrel you do not have because you do not ask. We have talked about this before. Sin always leads to death. 
No matter what, sin will always lead to death. We know that we should be equating the word sin to death, not sometimes, not not most of the time, but every single time. When there is sin, you will find death. Death of relationship, death of trust, death of uh, intent, death of another gift. There will be a death always associated with sin, and a precursor to sin is unchecked desire. James is saying these unchecked desires lead to sin, and that should concern you Because sin leads to death, it always leads to death. If you will not lean on Jesus and choose Jesus and ask Jesus, please take this desire away from you. If you will not pray much like David prayed when he said, create in me a clean spirit and sustain me. If you will not do this, these desires will give birth to sin and it will lead to death. Church, The unchecked desire for more money will lead to the sin of theft or greed. James is literally saying you don't have it and so you steal for it. And you might be sitting here saying, well, I don't don't steal. I've never stolen. But sometimes I withhold stuff and I want you to know it's the same thing. That desire for more of something will often lead to sin. The unchecked desire for more time often leads to the sin of laziness or selfishness. The, un, or the unchecked desire for sex outside of God's plan will lead to sexual sin of all kinds. The unchecked desire for more power can lead to all sorts of abusive sin. All kinds of sin comes from it and James is saying to these people that he loves and cares about about recognize these desires that you have and turn to Jesus lest you turn to the desire that will lead to sin and death church we shouldn't be afraid when we sin we're Christians we know what to do when we sin we repent that's what we do you sin and so you repent like oh man I messed up I told a lie what do I do I I repent I say, hey, I'm sorry I did that. I shouldn't do that. We should not be afraid when we have sinned, but we should be more afraid to sin because we know that it'll lead to death. And if a precursor to sin is desires, we should at least recognize these desires. We should recognize ourselves saying, hey, I want that thing and I shouldn't have it. I want this thing and it's not good for me. I want this activity and it's not meant for me. We should at least recognize it and take it to Jesus before that desire gives birth to sin, which always gives birth to death. Church, I want you to know that sometimes we are losing these battles because we don't recognize that we're in them. We get to walking around the world and we think that all this stuff that's happening around in this world every day is good for us, that it's for us, that that we should be in it. And we need to walk around with our eyes open and think, no, this is not our home. And because we are not in our home, we need to be more aware. I promise you this, when you're walking around Seattle, a town famous for having a gross gum wall, right? Like you are aware. You're aware. Like it's gross here. I'm going to watch where I put my hands here. And I'm telling you, that's this whole world is like that. We should at least be conscious. If you have ever gone on a trip to a country where you were unfamiliar, I promise you that you were more aware of your surroundings. You were paying attention to the place where you're in. And I'm telling you that as Christians, people saved for a totally different place than this, we should walk around more aware of what's happening and recognize these things. But we walk around blindly seeing all of these things that the world has to offer and we want it and we need to recognize it's not for us. These desires are not good for us and James wants us to get better at recognizing these things and taking them to Jesus before they lead to sin and death that is to follow. Church, in Jesus, you're free to not act upon your desires. You want good reason to sing today? You're not like George. You can say, you know what, that's not for me. Jesus, help me with this. I don't want to do that. You wouldn't have that for me. You didn't prepare that for me. Help me with that. In Jesus, you're free not to act upon your desires. Church, I want us to understand how dangerous these desires are. Uh, This is the next idea today. Christian, recognize that your desires can pollute even your prayers. James is so concerned about this because he's saying, hey, this can actually pollute your prayer life. These desires that you have are so powerful that they can sometimes even pollute your prayer life. James takes it this step further. and He says these are actually capable of polluting your prayers. This is what it says in verse 4-3. It says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. 
He says you are praying, you are asking God, but you are doing so out of a bad place because you have these desires that are clouding what you're asking for. There is a way to pray, truly asking for God's will to be done. There's a way to pray like that, to to say, God, I am up for a promotion at work and, and I would sure like that promotion. And if it be your will, I'd like to have that promotion, but your will be done, not mine. There's a way to say, God, I really like this girl and I really would like her to date me. And if it be your will and, and, and it works out the way you want it to, I would like that to happen. That's what I want. But your will be done, not mine. There's a way to say, hey, I'm thinking about moving my family across the country and I think it's good for us and I don't know for sure, but God, your will, not my will be done. That is a, a way to pray. There's a way to pray like that, but our desires are strong enough that they can also completely taint our prayer life. So instead of, God, instead of saying, God, let your will be done, we start prayers with, God, will you do this thing I want? God, I want this, give it to me. God, I need this thing, give it to me. And our desires are so strong that it will actually pollute our prayer life. And this, of course, leads to problems because God is not some sort of magic genie waiting on our beck and call. That's not who our God is. But we will pray really, really hard for what we want, not taking into account the fact that we are asking the creator of the universe for something with selfish, self-serving desires, and then we get all mad when he tells us no. We get all upset, like, oh, geez, God, you didn't see I threw a perfectly good tantrum. Can I have that thing I want? We get all mad, like, geez, what's going on? And this probably doesn't ever happen to you guys. You guys seem like really like, like, like holy people. This is probably just me. I'm just preaching to myself. You guys just go along for the ride. You seem like people that don't do this kind of thing. I'm sure most of you just pray with those perfect uh, intentioned prayers. Never let life's desires get in the way. It's probably, it's probably just me. Sometimes we ask God for things with the wrong posture, and then we get upset when God answers differently than we would want Him to. I've heard people say, I sometimes wonder if God's even listening to me. I've heard people say, I asked God and asked God, but He didn't give me what I want. I don't even know if He's here. And the best exclamation for this that I've ever heard came from Pastor Dan Yuri, who once said to me, God answers prayers like you would if you knew everything God knew. God literally knows everything, and so He answers our prayers the way that they should be answered if we knew everything that God knew, but we don't know everything God knew. This is profound because it's a reminder that as much as we would like to be, we're not God. Every single day, most of us are in a battle to try to take control of things back from God because what we really want is to be in charge of stuff. We really want to be in charge of everything. Next week, we're going to talk about submitting to God, and that's everybody's favorite word. It's going to be a fantastic Sunday. I love that. We're going to talk about submitting to God, and it's so hard because we don't like doing that. We're constantly like, Jesus, take the wheel, but not here. I need it here. This is a a scary part. I better handle it here, right? We're constantly fighting for this from God, and and we're doing this because, because we want to be in charge, and even in our prayer life, we just walk into like the prayer room, the throne room of God, and we're like, hey, God, I got this plan. Here's Here's my checklist. Give me this, 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 and this, and everything will be cool. I mean, how ridiculous must we look sometimes? I just imagine God up there sometimes listening to our prayers like, oh my gosh, (laughs) you want what? You think I would give you that? Like, come on, I ain't doing that. We're like the little kid in the store at the grocery store that like, have you ever walked around a grocery store? I did this one time when my kids were little. They walked, we walked around Walmart and I just took down the, a list of everything they asked for when we were in there. I just was curious. And I got to the end of this list. There's like 87 things on the list that would have cost me $1.3 million, right? If I would have just given them everything they wanted in Walmart, right? And I wonder if sometimes we look like that to God. Like, hey, can I, like, he's like, come on, like, no, you're not, you don't need that. Like, you don't need pink shoes. It's, it's not like, no. No, you don't need a candy bar and a Reese's. No, 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 come on. We're not God. And because of this, we can put our desires aside and pray for God to just do what's best in the situation. How freeing is it to know that you can go to the creator of the universe and say, hey, I don't really know what to do here, God. I think what I want is this. But you probably know better. Can I just have what's best? I mean, what a fantastic way to go in and pray. I have no idea what the right move is here, God. Can you just sort of handle this one? I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think? You see, in Jesus, you can pray for God's will and not your wants. 
And then James finally gets to the the hinge point of this passage, and he tells us the reason why the people he is writing to are struggling, and why the people gathered here in this room today are struggling. It's because we are not recognizing that we are not to be friends with this world. Christian, recognize that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Look what James says in verse 4. This is so hard to read, but I'm going to read it anyway. It says, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This is one of the clearest statements in this entire letter. It's also one of the hardest statements in this entire letter. And so we're so thankful for grace as we read through it together and feel the weight of it on our, on our own bodies. It just it, it presses us. This idea that we can't be friends with the world. And it's one of the things that clarifies why we struggle so much with worldly desires. We're drawn to the things of this world and we don't recognize how counter this broken world is to God. We just don't recognize it. We're, 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 we're failing to recognize it. And James sees these people he's writing to, these people that he cares so much about, trying to walk with both a foot in the world and a foot with God, and he knows how bad this is and actually accuses them of adultery. He says, like, you're actually cheating on God to be with the world. Church, I think sometimes we think that these Bible times people are so different than us. That sometimes, somehow Bible times people are just like living in this completely different world. But I want you to know that they are regular people just like you and me. They're trying to raise their kids just like you and me. They're trying to figure out how to follow Jesus in a broken world just like you and me. These are not different people than us. They got the same problems that we do. Trying to figure out what am I supposed to wear today? What am I supposed to do today? How am I going to make the rent payment? So they're going to try to figure out all this stuff. The same thing. They're struggling with the same things that we struggle with. They're just trying to figure out how do I follow Jesus? Jesus in a broken world just like us, and they are being distracted by the shiny, sparkling, and broken, th- broken things of this world just like you and I are. We get distracted by it. We get drawn into it. We get confused by it. And James is asking them to recognize it so they can stop. Recognize it. Oftentimes our desire to be friendly with the world, we are acting as enemies of God. Oftentimes in our desire to not offend the things of this world, we are offending the creator of the universe. Come back next week, we're going to unpack that idea. We are so much more willing to offend the creator of the universe, the very one who sent Jesus down here to save us. We're we're so much more willing to offend God in 2022 than we are to offend others. And James is saying, not like that. Stop it. Recognize what you're doing. Recognize that this is not your home and not your God. And when you can recognize it, you can embrace God fully. If you've ever tried to do two things at once, you'll know that you can't do either of them well. Don't at me with the multitasking. I know the women are better at it than the men. I'll give you that, it's be- that you're better. But nobody is good at doing two things equally well at the same time, except Janine. But, you know, she's like a unicorn. It's different. Nobody else. You're not good at it. We're not good at trying to live in and serve the world, walk in and be part of the world, and at the same time love God. And I want you to know that in Jesus, you can embrace full friendship with God. In Jesus, you can do that and you can do this because God wants a relationship with you. Church, here is some fantastic news. As we're reading through this heavy stuff in James, sometimes you'll wonder, like, what is my reason to sing today? Well, here's your reason to sing. Christian, recognize that God wants all of you. This is so amazing to me. We could just spend all morning here on this idea. We are adulterous people who constantly choose something else instead of God. And then we repent for it and we believe again. That's what we do. We've been doing that since the very, very beginning. If the entire Bible was a timeline, that's what it looks like. Man's relationship with God has been like that. God gave them everything. God said to Adam and Eve, here is everything and it's beautiful and it's perfect. You can have all of it. Just don't eat of that one thing. You get all of God. You get to literally walk with him and talk with him and hang out with him in the garden. Just whatever you do, don't eat that one apple. And you know what they did? They ate the apple or fruit, whatever it is. We don't know. They ate that fruit. They ate it. 
They cheated on God for some fruit. And you'd be like, why would you do that? That's so stupid. And then God said, hey, okay, hey, look, I, I, I'm going like, to try to help you guys out. We're going to start over. I'm going to give you some rules to follow. Just follow these 10 things. There's just like a couple of rules, just follow these rules. And you know what the people said? No, we don't want to. We're going to choose everything else instead of your ways, God. And all, if, if you lay this out, God said, well, the people said, hey, wait, maybe if we had some judges, that would help. And so God said, okay, well, here's some judges. And that didn't help them. They still chose everything else and not God. And then over here, they said, well, if we could just get some kings, if we got some kings, that would really help us out. And then the people still chose everything else besides God. And then they said, well, if the Messiah would ever show up, up, that would sure help a lot. Maybe you get around to sending the Messiah. And so God sends Jesus and we hung him on a cross. We just keep choosing everything else besides God over and over and over again. And if you were to look at that relationship, if that's the relationship between God and man, man always chooses everything other than God. And you know what God does? God just keeps chasing after his creation. God just keeps chasing after man. God says, hey, you messed up again. I'm right here. Come on home. Did you mess up again? I'm right here. Come on home. Did you mess up again? I'm right here. Come on home. Church, I want you to recognize that God wants all of you. Look what it says in James 4, 5. Or do you suppose it is, it is to no purpose that the Scripture says He yearns jealously over the Spirit that He has made to dwell in us? Has it ever occurred to you that of all the things that God created, you are His masterpiece? Has it ever occurred to you that you are the one that he wants to walk and talk with? This is how it was in the garden. God created everything, and then he literally would walk and talk with Adam right until the time that Adam and Eve sinned and broke the world and put a separation between God and man. God wants you. He loves you. He cares for you. He has good plans, godly plans for your life. He has prepared good and godly things for you to enjoy. And in Jesus, you can experience all God wants and has for you but all too often we don't recognize that and so we're so tempted to go after the things of the world we're so tempted by our desires to go after something that is so much less than what God has for us God's like hey I've got this amazing place for you I've got, like, I'm, 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 like, I'm preparing it. Jesus has been preparing this place for you, and it's going to be so fantastic. And we're like, yeah, but like, I really want this thing over here. Like this dirty little shiny object, I kind of want that. God's like, no, I've got this really great plan for you. And we're like, yeah, but i got a little plan over here too. God's like, like, like i got this perfect thing for you. And we're like, nah. In Jesus, we can experience all that God wants for us. I think as we're reading through James, it's like heavy because sometimes he's going to call us adulterers. He's going to remind us of like how bad it is, like how bad we are, how much our desires get in the way. And yet there is so much grace to go around. Grace just abounds in this. Do you know how much God loves you? God wants you so much. It, it says this in the scriptures, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. God wants you so much that he sent Jesus down here on a rescue mission to save you. God wants you so much that while Jesus was here, he lived the perfect life that you never could, died the horrific death that you deserved, and defeated that death so that anyone who would believe in him could spend eternity with him. And because of that, we can walk around every day and recognize this is not our home. This is not our home. And if you want some more good news, the Bible tells us a little bit about what our home is going to be like. And as we get ready to sing this morning, I want to just share that with you. I want to tell you what your home is like if you believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This is what it says from Revelation. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be 
and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Do you see how different that world is than this world? You won't have to wonder where God is at. You will literally walk and talk with him. It goes on to say, he will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment the one who conquers will have his heritage and i will be his god and he will be my son that is your world christian this is just where you live now recognize it and live like that why would we be here except to be on mission here why would we be here except to lean on god here to say to God, there are things in this place that are so broken and I don't know what to do with it, but I'm going to serve you and trust you. To say to God, there are things in this world that are so broken and so gross, they must not be for me, and so I'm going to ask you to help me with these desires. Church, if you can know who Jesus is, you can recognize that this is not your home and you can live like that. Can you believe that today? Let's pray. God, we get so sucked into this world. We get so sucked into thinking that the things of this world are permanent and we forget that You are infinite. Help us to at least recognize it as we leave this week. To recognize that even our own desires can, can try to pull us away from You. And as many times as we turn away from you as many times as we walk away from you god you continue to just welcome us home help us to know that and believe that and lean on you more and god if there is anybody in this room today who has never believed in you who doesn't know the freedom that comes from choosing your ways instead of the world's ways help them to believe today give them the faith to believe it's in your name that we pray. Amen.